Okay, I want to talk about Andre Agassi. Now, on this channel, I've done a lot of things. I've talked about, I've shown myself playing guitar, working out, giving political speeches, impersonating Kennedy, talking about my dad, talking about my life, right? So I want this channel to be as, uh, as me as possible, not bound to any specific piece of content. Because there's a lot that, that goes into me and comprises me. And I don't want to mentally sit there and plan what this channel is supposed to be. Same thing, I don't want to do that with my life either. I want to allow it to free flow, allow it to come out, allow what's really within me to express itself on this channel. So today, I want to talk about Agassi. So Andre Agassi is a pro from the 90s and the early 2000s. And he's a pro tennis player. Um, when I was in high school, <laughs> God, what am I saying? I was in elementary school. <laughs> I was 10, <laughs> and uh, I was part of this summer program, and we, we studied, uh, it, we learned tennis, and it was my sister's high school tennis coach who was teaching this kid's tennis, and we were supposed to do a biography at the end of the thing on some tennis player, and we drew, like, out of a hat or something. I drew Pete Sampras, and I did a biography on him. My friend drew Arne Agassi, who's Sampras's rival. Now, Sampras was the most successful player of the 90s. At the time he was playing in which he retired, people thought, this is the best I've ever seen. I've never played someone better. No one can be better than this. I can't imagine it, right? That's how good this guy, Sampras, was. Uh, Agassi was his rival. You see, he was the second fiddle. But that's no small thing, because Agassi was an extremely good player as well. And he was a tortured soul. So he grew up in Vegas, I believe, and... Uh, his father came from Iran and was a wrestler back in the 50s, I think, and was very, very rough, very rough on him. And he put him through all sorts of difficulties growing up in the ambition and hope of training him to be a pro. One good thing that he did is that the father dangled a tennis ball above Andre's crib. So when Andre was like, you know, one or two years old, he's just, he's just playing with his ball, you see, and developing his hand-eye coordination and as it did turn out, when he was a pro, he had the best hand-eye anyone had seen. You know, he could just, he would never miss hit. He hit so cleanly, see? And he went through a lot of struggling and suffering and stress growing up, but eventually he ended up making it on the pro tour. And he was a, he was a rising star, but when he got on the tour, he didn't succeed. He had this, he'd get to the final of a Grand Slam, which are the major big tournaments like Wimbledon and all, and he'd just choke. He would just play someone he was better than, play someone he should have beaten, and, and lose. Four or five times this happened. And the first slam finally played was against Pete Sampras. <laughs> Pete Sampras, right? And Sampras beat him. I think he beat him in straight sets, so pretty convincingly. And as time went on, Agassi went through a lot of change. In 92, he went on to Wimbledon. Wimbledon is grass. It's his least favorite surface. And he's just like, he was playing against a grass court specialist, some Ivan Isevich was the guy's name. And this guy was supposed to smoke him. And I guess he said, well, I'm supposed to lose anyway. I'm the underdog. I don't even care, right? He let go. He let go in his mind. And uh, a few hours later, he had the trophy. And that was actually just a few days before I was born. I was born July 15th, 1992, and that was early July 92. So it's the last slam that I wasn't around for. So as time went on, he became a very sensational figure in American sports and in American households to the point that like people like my dad, who my dad was not a tennis follower, but he knew who Andre Agassi was. <clears throat> But he didn't know who Pete Sampras was. Why would he? My dad doesn't follow tennis. But Agassi was outside of tennis. Agassi was a household figure. People knew who he was uh, because he had this, this flaming personality. He was very exciting. He was very charismatic. He made so much money from endorsements and from Nike, from Canon, um, from Prince Rackets in the beginning and then Head Rackets later, the European company. And he was, he was an icon. He was an American hero, too. He was a crowd favorite. I believe the crowd would be for him when he played Sampras in America, and they're both American. He just had so much, um, so much within him. 
And basically, at one point, he imploded. Um, in 97, he, he, he was sort of living this rock star lifestyle, right? Like, he said early on, like, I only eat pizza and cheeseburgers. And, you know, he was fine when he was young. And then he just kept going down this sort of hedonistic path to overcome all this craziness that was inside of him, this anger, this fear, this, this depravity, not that's the wrong word, but this desperation, whatever it was from the pain he had growing up with his dad, it was so, so, so mean to him. And he said that he hated playing tennis. He does an autobiography. I think one of the first sentences he writes is, I hate tennis. And yet he was still playing, yet he was able to beat Sampras, yet he was able to win Wimbledon and the Grand Slams and be world number one and all these things. See, but on the inside, he was really dying, dying, suffering, whatever you want to call it. And he went to the brink of despair. You know, he married Brooke Shields, who's an actress, um, and, you know, eventually his whole Hollywood lifestyle crumbled. He was losing his hair, so he was losing his looks um, at some point in the early 90s. And he started wearing a toupee, right? Uh, and everything just fell apart. And in 1997, 1997, he hit the worst part of his life. He was only 27 years old. His marriage broke up. His career went to crap. He went down to uh, number 141 in the world. And he is a former world number one. See? Uh, he... And he, he emerged as a different person, though. He completely transformed himself over some, some period of several months or a year or something. He hired Tony Robbins to help him transform. He shaved his head, and his new look was like a fully shaved, bald head. Uh, he started working out a lot. I'm sure he took his diet and all very seriously. And instead of being this like petulant, punk-like person, he became extraordinarily humble. What he, he would, at the end of matches, he would turn to the four corners of the stadium and bow each way. He, he began to love the crowd, really love them, not egoically love them, but feel a connection with them. And he became a better tennis player, too. Though he was past his physical peak as far as, you know, when you're a man, your physical peak is 25 to 28 or something, and he was right at that spot, right? Uh, in 1999, he came back after ascending again. He won the French Open for the first time. He won what's called a career slam, winning all four grand slams, which only a few people have done. At that point, especially, Pete Sampras has not even done it. You retire without doing it, and most people don't. So only Agassi was in a club of maybe four, or four people or something who have been able to win all four. He lost at Wimbledon to Sampras in the final. He won the U.S. Open in 99. And then the Australian Open in 2000, he won that too, which is, I think he beat Sampras. I don't know who he beat in 2000, but he won three out of four Grand Slams. And the only one he lost was to Sampras at Wimbledon, and there's no shame in that. So that that's an extraordinarily good year. He, he, went, he started the decade losing to Sampras at the U.S. Open in 1990. And then... In to, to close the decade, to close the century, to close the millennium, in the last Grand Slam of that millennium, the U.S. Open 1999, in September 99, he won it. Then he won the first of this millennium, too. And he won a few more Australian Opens, too. So he won eight Grand Slams in total, many of them into his, uh, into his mm, uh, you know, early 30s. So... What he did was, you know, extraordinary. To, to be able to win at that level is extraordinary enough, but to transform in that manner is extraordinary. And he wrote about this in his book. He wrote a book that came out in maybe '09 or something. I bought it in 2012. I read it when I was in college. And I, he didn't write it. He, he got together with some writer, and then he dictated stuff, and then the writer put the actual words on the paper in his own words, telling Agassiz's story. But nonetheless, it's his content, right? He, it, it is so strikingly personal and vulnerable. And he talks about his struggle. 
And that's, that's the important thing. He struggled. Not just struggled to work out, not struggled on his mind, not struggled learning how to win, not struggled with strategy. Although, all that too. He struggled as a human. He struggled as a, as a soul. And he went from being horrifically unhappy to being tremendously happy and tremendously successful and tremendously peaceful inside. And rather than devoting his, all of his time and attention, all this hedonistic craziness, he became some advocate for education. And not just an advocate, I believe he, make, he gives money to these like, funds in Las Vegas that uh, educates underprivileged kids. And he says that the requirement for the teachers who work there is they have to believe that every student can learn. And when they have that belief, they behave in that way and they're able to help that student learn. Students that other people would just give up on or that are normally not given any attention to. This is what Agassiz has turned his life and his life's work into. Um, what's extraordinary about his career as well is that he was in the top five or top ten in three different decades. So in the late 80s, he was in the top five or ten. In the 90s, he was in the top five or ten. He was number one, right? And in the 2000s, he was number one, too, in the beginning of the uh, century. And he got to play people from all the generations. See, he played Jimmy Connors. I believe he played Connors. Pretty sure. I'm, I can guarantee you he played Connors. I don't know a specific match. But Jimmy Connors is a pro from the 70s. He played Connors. He played McEnroe. He played Yvonne Lendl. These are guys from the 70s, 80s, that generation, the dominant forces from then. See, he was the dominant force among them in the 90s. He played Jim Currier. He played Andre, uh, Pete Sampras. These are all American. Well, Lendl's not American. These are all American so far, right? Lendl is Croatian, I believe. He played all those people. Pat Rafter, who's Australian, who's a little, uh, not as successful of a pro, but still world number one and all that in the late 90s. Right? He played those greats, and then he played Roger Federer in the, in the late 90s when Federer was 17. Their first match was in Basel in 98, Basel, Switzerland. And I guess he beat the 17-year-old kid really easily. But they played a few more times, and Federer really had his number, especially when Federer became the world number one. Um, they played this fantastic match at the U.S. Open in 04, and then another in 05, the 05 final. And I was watching tennis at that time. I was across the river in New Jersey, and I saw that match and is, to this day, my favorite match of all time. The quality was electric. The Federer was just unhinged. He was, just, he was fly, flying fearless and flawless, as one of my friends put it. And Agassi, at the age of 35, was playing Roger Federer in, in Roger Federer's prime, and he was with him. He was with him about 70% of the match, and about 60% of the match through, he actually got ahead. Agassi was actually winning this match. And then Federer turned it around, and he kicked it up into a gear that Agassi said that other players simply are not capable of. And then for the last, say, 20% of the match, 25, Federer just ran away with it. See, But that's what Agassi did in, in the 05 U.S. Open. He played Nadal and Wimbledon in 06, his last Wimbledon. 14 years after he won, it was against Rafael Nadal in 06. That was his last match at Wimbledon, he lost. And Nadal made it to the final, lost to Fed. So basically, you know, this guy's, this guy's played everybody. <laughs> McEnroe, Lendl, Connors, uh, Sampras, Federer, Nadal. That's, uh, that, 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 these are the dominant forces in different decades. That's the longevity that Andre Agassi had. So. When I was uh, shopping for rackets, my first racket that I got was a head radical, which is what he used. It's slightly different. Uh, it's old at this point, and it looks, looks like it's not being used because it's not. I haven't used this in many years, but I still have it. You know, head liquid metal radical. This was my racket in high school. I had three of these. For four years, I used this. And... Um, yeah, this was the Agassi racket. His was bigger, and then he went through different iterations, the TI radical, the I radical, the liquid metal radical, which is this, flex point, microgel, you, you name it, right? Although, microgel is past his time, but yeah, you know, I use this racket, and it's a, it's a fantastic racket. I loved this racket. That's why I still have it. I didn't throw it out. I purchased this 14 years ago, and I still have it. See? 
you know. So, anyway, that's just the uh, a little bit about this uh, legend, this tennis legend. So, you know, let me actually get his book. I have his book. I want to actually just show it to you. Okay. Open by Andre Agassi. I showed this this very cover to my roommate in college, and he said, "I see pain in those eyes. There are deep wells of pain in these eyes." This is Agassi when he was a kid and when he had hair. This book is called Open. It's a double meaning and I, I just realized it. The first meaning of course is, you know, he plays the US Open, the Australian Open, the, the Cincinnati Open, all these Opens, right? But the book's title is Open because in this book, he is open. He's an open book. He talks about how he got busted for drugs in the late 90s by, the, by the, the tennis council and how he lied about it and in, in order to keep playing. He talks about all the dissatisfaction. He, had. he talked about horrible things his father did to him. He talks about the coaches he had, why he broke up with certain coaches. He talks about what he thought about Pete Sampras. He talks about... You know, don't tell, I don't tell Brad that I hit the wall every day. It would crush him to know that the wall felt good, that I kissed the wall, that I'm glad I lost, that I'd rather be back on that plane back to Los Angeles than lacing up for a rematch with our old friend. I'd rather be anywhere but here. See? But soon I'm going to be watching... Uh, an episode of Friends featuring Brooke Shields, his ex-wife. You see, so th this is all the stuff on the inside that you don't see in the image. All the stuff he didn't tell Brad, all the stuff he didn't tell anybody until he finally opened up in this book. And I'm very happy to say that I think the last line of this book, I remember it, though I read it a long time ago. It left, ooh, look. This is him with some of his kids. This is Las Vegas kids. The kids that he uh, provides education for and stuff. Last line of this book is, the first line of the book is, he talks about how he hates tennis, right? The last line of the book is, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> you should read it. You should read the book. You should read the book. You should read the book. But it's, it's the journey of a person. And he had the journey of a person as being this pro tennis player, this national hero, this Hollywood star almost type of life. But that journey within the soul within him is what's common among all people. And that's what anybody has to learn. From reading his story. So that's what I have to say about Andre Agassi. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And as much as I knew about it that I could possibly say in this amount of time, I've said. So th there's always more to talk, but that's as much as I can go for right now. But that's just a story of just one of the many, many, many people that we live among on this day. <laughs>